uh, your provisions this past week. And I pray, Father, that you'll help us to really uh, dive into this last uh, passage or the last verses of Romans chapter uh, 16 as we conclude this book. I pray, Father, that you have taught us many things uh, throughout the, uh, the past 16 chapters as we've studied it for the past almost two years. So, Father, um, may uh, you help us to really uh, continue to read it and to study it, and that we'll be able to, uh, uh, to grow from it and learn from it. So we thank you for all that you do in our lives. In your sons, I pray. Amen. Please open up to uh, Romans chapter 16, uh, verses 25 through 27. We're at the last three verses. If you have your Bibles open, this is what it says. Uh, Paul concludes with his doxology or benediction. And it says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through prophetic writings has been made known to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to, etern to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God be glory forever, more through Jesus Christ. Amen. Again, we're at the very end of the book of Romans. I believe we started tackling the book in, ja in July of 2020. Uh, and it's been almost two years. And it ends this with this beautiful doxology. Praising God for what he has done through his son, Jesus Christ. This grand finale brings the book of Romans to the, this eloquent conclusion. This grand finale befitting God the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the gospel by which we come to know them. It is a proclamation of what is true. And God's plan was to save people through Jesus Christ from the very beginning. How many of you guys know what the name doxology means? And where doxology comes from? Anybody? Doxology comes from the Greek word doxa, and it originally meant simply an opinion. And your opinion of someone was your doxology regarding that person. And over time, through periods of time, doxa came to refer to someone's reputation or power. Eventually, it came to mean honor or glory bestowed on someone. So Paul, what he's doing is with this doxology or this benediction, he is giving honor and glory to God. Even all the things that he's written, he ends with this doxology, this honor and glory to God for what God has done in Paul's life. And of course, in the Bible, the one who is deserving of doxa is none other than God. God and God alone is deserving of glory and honor. It is this response as we as believers are to have towards God, praising God and giving glory and honor to him. That each day that we live, every day, we are to give him honor. We are to give him glory. Here's a practice. Every night before we go to sleep, Give him glory. Give him honor. For what he has done for us throughout that one day. From the beginning, when we arise, when we wake up, to the very moment when we go to sleep. And Paul, as he concludes this book, praises God by touching on themes that are prevalent in the book of Romans. And the first theme comes from the beginning of verse 25. The very beginning is 25. The gospel that strengthens us. The gospel that strengthens us. And it says, not to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel. 
Paul begins the doxology with now to him who is able. And when translated into English, the word able does injustice. In the Greek, the word that is translated able is this word duna meno. And this word duna meno yields our translated word dynamite. And Paul is praising Jesus who was powerful and dynamic. Meaning if we pretty much translated it literally, directly, it will be now to who is dynamic or dynamite. This power that God has, that Jesus Christ has. It is this dynamic power of Jesus that is not only capable of breaking through a depraved, or depraved and blinded hearts, but building and reestablishing our lives for his glory. I've been here almost three years, I believe. Next week will be our three-year anniversary. That will be in this, and then the contract has been renewed for the next three years, God willing, that we'll all be together. I don't think anybody in this room really knows my past. Joanne knows a little bit of my past, but she doesn't know the greedy dirtiness of my past. She doesn't know who I was when I, before I came to know Christ, or even probably after that. She's known me ever since I've been a pastor, an ordained pastor at that. So she knows my spiritual life, who I am as a pastor. But if you were to go back and talk to people who know me ever since I was little, talk to my parents, talk to my brothers, my cousins, my friends when I was younger, and you ask them this one question, did you ever think Chang would become a pastor. 100% people will say no. No. It's because of his lifestyle, right? Because before I came to know Christ when I was 16 years old, I swore a lot, I fought a lot, I beat up people a lot. I did things that you did not like, you didn't, you, parents, Look at kids and say, don't ever do it. Even prior to that, never do this, I cheated a lot. Oh, you guys are so good kids, you never cheat, right? Cheated a lot, stole a lot, right? Yeah. How can God ever use a person like that? People will probably say not in a million years. I shared with you guys why my parents prayed, or my, that my parents prayed every day. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure part of that prayer was, oh, Lord, please save this little boy. Show him grace, show him mercy, show him your love. That one day that he will see the light. That one day he will be able to see who you are. Doxa, giving honor and glory. Do no meno, that God is dyna, dynamic, that he is that powerful. It is Jesus and only Jesus, at least for me and hopefully for you, who powerfully changes lives, who changes our direction. That we used to go one way, and God, Jesus Christ, powerfully changes that direction to go his way, his path. I must always remember it is God who establishes my life for his glory. It is God and God only. It is God who strengthens me where I can, where I can and that, and we all can say, what Paul writes in Romans, in the very beginning of Romans chapter 1, verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, 
for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. The power of God never being ashamed of the gospel because God has changed us. God directs us to his path, his way. So therefore, if God powerfully, through his son, his death and resurrection, powerfully changes us, we should never, ever be ashamed of this gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. When I was younger, I did not like public speaking. Who loves public speaking in here? Anybody? Anybody that loves to be here and talk? None of you? Uh, some of you probably, right? But most people, they have this fear of public speaking. I have fear of public speaking. The very first message that I ever prepared and I ever spoke was at my Bible college. And it was about the armor of God, and I wrote everything down, the hand scripted it. My professor was there, my peers were there, the camera was point, pointing and recording. At that moment, they were recording through VHS. You guys know what VHS is? You do? <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, we don't ever use VHS anymore. I never use cassettes. Right? But they were recording on this VHS, and they were recording, and I manuscripted it, and I, and I was wearing a tan shirt. At the end of this message, I never looked up. I just read what I wrote. And at the end of this message, I was still tan right here. But in the back, it was nicely browned. Why? Because of all that sweat that I was, I was sweating. I forgot to wear my perspirant or deodorant or whatever all over my, but it was all sweating. Because I was so, so nervous. And the professor, and usually we, after we, we speak, you know, he lets out the class earlier and then we go and we review what I spoke. And he goes, you know, you had good content, there was good, everything was good, but you gotta look up. I was like, I didn't wanna look up. Because, but he says you gotta look up. You have to have eye contact. You can't just continually be reading. Right? I had the fear of speaking. I had a fear of sharing the gospel. It's amazing that it is somebody who brought me to church was my parents. Somebody who God used a pastor. Some God, some situation at a retreat. That God put this everything in, in order, in order to have me accept Christ as my Lord and Savior. And in this passage, it says in Romans again, 1 it says, Not to be ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for everyone who believes. Yet here I was, who I, when I was saved, I was afraid to share the gospel to others. My fear was not about Christ. My fear was about people judging me. And that's the great fear. But when we have to understand, it is the gospel that needs to be preached. And I, and only I, am just a messenger. And not the subject. Because right? God is the subject. So when I understood, and it took a while, when I understood that it was not about me, but it, so it was only about Jesus Christ, that is when the fear disappeared. That I become nothing, but in Christ becomes everything. I don't stand up here without Christ. I don't stand up here without the strength of Christ who strengthens me. I am not who I am without Christ. Christ is the one who establishes me, who has rooted me firmly in the truth of the gospel, to be firm. 
And to always, as we spoke about last Sunday, to always be on alert for false teachers. And how do we do that? Always getting into the word. And it is Christ who has firmly rooted me in the truth of the gospel. The gospel, the God is able to establish the minds and the hearts of believers in the truth, to settle us, ground us, and make us firm in him. So another challenge is read the, read the, read the word. Spend time in the word. Know the word. Because once we know the word, once we study the word, we know the power behind it. And we know it is the gospel that changes lives. And when we do that, we have no fear in sharing the gospel to others because we have prepared ourselves for that moment. Or Christ has prepared us for that moment. The second theme comes from the middle part of verse 25, and it says this, According to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. The gospel has Jesus Christ as its source and purpose. And the major theme of Romans, like the major theme of all scriptures, is Jesus Christ. Without Jesus Christ, there is no purpose. There is no gospel. There is no New Testament. There's still that Old Testament, but yet even the Old Testament, where there's prophecies all about Jesus Christ. So it's really, without Jesus Christ, there is really no New Testament. We're still in this intertestamental times from Old Testament to New Testament, which was 400 years, now it's 2,000 years later, that intertestamental times would be 2,400 years that we will be still in. Christian's purpose is to declare Jesus Christ, to preach Jesus Christ, to share about Jesus Christ, to believe in Jesus, but not to declare him is utterly ridiculous. To believe in the Son of God, to believe in this gospel of Jesus Christ, to believe in the power of God, but yet we don't share that gospel, is utterly ridiculous. It's almost like having a Lamborghini, Rolls Royce, McLaren, Ferrari, Tesla Plaid, Lucid Dream, and keeping it in your garage and never driving it. Why would you have such cars and just keep it in your garage? You want to tell people that you have this car, you would drive it. When I'm driving and I see a Lamborghini, I don't care what color it is, I look at it and I keep looking at it because I like the car. Lucid Dream, I don't know what that car looks like, but I'm sure I will keep looking at it too because people are driving it. What I'm saying is we have Jesus Christ that is greater and more precious than these, but we can't hold it for ourselves. We can't keep it for ourselves. We can't bottle it for ourselves. We have to tell other people about it. We should be like this wanting to explode and telling people who Christ is. We have something that is priceless, something money can't buy, so precious that there is only one. Many Lamborghinis out there, many McLarens out there, many Ferraris are out there, but there is only one Jesus, so precious, so priceless. Nothing, something money cannot buy. We have Jesus Christ in our lives. We have Jesus Christ to share the message to and to others. And our purpose and our responsibility 
as believers and as Christians, I believe as Paul is concluding the book of Romans, is to go share, to preach, and to declare. See, Paul, from the moment when he met Christ on the road to Damascus, he made a commitment to preach Jesus. And it's incredible how God used Paul. How many of you guys know how many books Paul wrote? Anybody know how many books Paul wrote? There's 39 books in the Old Testament. There's 27 books in the New Testament. He wrote how many books in the New Testament? Youth ministry? Uh, you're, you're a little off, right? 13, you got it. Right. He wrote 13 books out of the 27 in the New Testament. And listen to these three passages that Paul wrote to. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 23 to 25, it says, But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God, for the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. 2 Corinthians 4, 5 through 6, For what we proclaim is not over, it's not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord with ourselves as, our, as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Romans ten seventeen. so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. This is Paul preaching. This is Paul testifying of Jesus Christ. His commitment was not no other, but Christ was first and foremost in his life, his mind, and his heart. It is this commitment that Christians are to have. We are to have Christ as the center of our lives, where Christ is number one, where other things are a distant second. Can I challenge you with two things this coming week? It'll take some time. One is write your own personal testimony if you're saved. If you are a believer, if you've never wrote, written a testimony, or the last time you wrote a testimony was your baptism and your past 30, it means that you haven't written it for a long time, I would encourage you to sit down this coming week and to write your own testimony. And you will see how God has worked in your life. How God has transformed you. I was taking a personal evangelism class. And this professor said, write your testimony. Said, That's easy. I'll write my testimony. He gave me a B. I was like, it's my testimony. He gave me a B. I said, like, why is it a B? Well, and I was like, you, can't, you cannot grade a person's testimony. Why would you grade someone's testimony? He said, it's your writing. Well, who cares about the writing? It's a testimony. It's the power of that, in that testimony. It's the power of God transforming this young man who came to know Christ. So I won't be testing your, I won't be grading your testimony. But please sit down and really write and pen out or type your testimony. And you will see how God has powerfully worked in our lives. Second, as we write that testimony, go share the gospel with someone. One person. Share the message with one person. If you're at Costco and there's a person behind you, and I know that all the mall Costco is so busy and so packed, you're going to be waiting in that line for about 15, 20 minutes. We have that 15, 20 minutes to talk to that person about Christ. Anywhere, your neighbor, just go share that message. And say, you wanna, I want to tell you about Jesus. I want to tell you how this person changed my 
life. And if you have written your testimony by then, let me read you my testimony about how Jesus changed me and powerfully changed me. Gospel strengthens us. Gospel declares Jesus. The third theme comes from the last part of verse 25 to verse 27. He says, the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made to all nations, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. What it's saying is the gospel is no longer hidden or kept secret. The gospel is revealed truth. And before the revelation of these truths, parts or aspects of this truth were kept secret. It was hidden. A mystery is to be understood with future revelation in mind from God. And parts of it were not revealed until the right moment. Let's put it this way. Mystery is like the car commercials events in which the new model is covered with a sheet or canvas. You can see the shape of it, but not the details. The engineer knows what's underneath the canvas. The designer already knows the shape of the car. But the car remains hidden to the rest of us. So too, the mystery of which Paul spoke was hidden until the right moment when God revealed or unveiled it. The gospel was revealed to the world with the coming and the ministry of Jesus Christ. From the end of Malachi to the beginning of Matthew, there was 400 years of silence from God. And let me read you a quote. He says, the events of the intertestamental period set the stage for Christ and a profound impact on the Jewish people. Both Jews and pagans from other nations were becoming dissatisfied with religion. The pagans were beginning to question the validity of polytheism. Romans and Greeks were drawn from their mythologies toward the Hebrew scriptures, now easily accessible in Greek or Latin. The Jews, however, were despondent. Once again, they were conquered, oppressed, and polluted. Hope was running low. Faith was even lower. They were convinced that now the only thing can, that could save them in their faith was the appearance of the Messiah. Not only were people primed and ready for the Messiah, but what God was moving in other ways as well. The Romans had built roads to aid the spread of the gospel. Everyone understood a common language, Koine Greek, the language of the New Testament. And there was a fair amount of peace and freedom to travel, further aiding the dissemination of the gospel. The New Testament tells the story of how hope came, not only for the Jews, but for the entire world. Christ's fulfillment of prophecy was anticipated and recognized by many who sought him out. The story of the Roman centurion, the wise man, and the Pharisee Nicodemus show how Jesus was recognized as the Messiah by those from several different cultures. The 400 years of silence of the intertestamental period were broken by the greatest story ever told the gospel of Jesus Christ. In our hands is the greatest story that has ever been told, and it's the true story. Not something that was made up by men, but some, a true story, and we hold it in our hands to tell people, and that is our purpose and our responsibilities. With the coming of Jesus Christ, something unique happen. Eternity invaded time, and God the Son emerged on earth. With the arrival of Jesus Christ, the world could never be the same again. The mystery of the good news that was hidden has now been revealed through the life, death, and resurrection, and exaltation 
of Jesus Christ. The world can never be the same again with the arrival of Jesus Christ. With the arrival of Jesus Christ in our lives, if we accepted him as our Lord and Savior, our lives can never be the same. It cannot go back to the same. It must move forward. The gospel gives us strength. The gospel has declared Jesus Christ, and the gospel has revealed its mysteries. The world is ripe. The harvest is plentiful, but workers are few. Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, are to take the gospel to all corners of the world, to look up continually to God and sharing, preaching Jesus Christ through faith and obedience. Christians' journey is to never be satisfied in living out Christ who lives in us. Jesus never said the journey, the adventure was going to be easy. And believers have chosen this narrow path. But what God does for you and I in this journey, he will continue to strengthen us. And the greatest thing of all, he will walk with us side by side alongside us. Jesus challenged those as he was ascending. In Matthew 28, verses 19 to 20, the Great Commission. He says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. 